Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor of Philosophy Daniel C. Dinette III. Uh, Professor Dinette is a prolific author um, of many books, uh, including the ideas of workings of the mind. He is co-director of the Center for Cognitive Studies and a university professor and Austin B. Fletcher Professor of Philosophy at Tufts University in Boston. He's worked on artificial intelligence. Uh, he has an interesting stance on religion, i.e. atheism. Uh, he's interested in evolution. Um, and among other topics, he is basically a lightning rod kind of a guy who likes controversy and to break old concepts. Um, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1987. In his current book about which he'll speak tonight, uh, From Bacteria to Bach and Back, The Evolution of Minds, he builds on ideas from computer science and biology to posit bold stances upon how we came upon conscious minds. Um, the book has been called Illuminating and Insightful. Uh, what I learned about Professor Dinette in my brief research was that at age 11, at summer camp, he was told at age 11, quote, you know what you are, Daniel, a philosopher, unquote. So I, it means that our, my grandson only has to wait four more years to be told what he is. I'd like to, I'd like to be around when that happens. Um, he, he also has described, this is his 18th book, I believe, when his 16th book was discussed in the New York Times, the fellow talking about it said that he had a Darwin-esque beard. So when he comes up here, you'll know the guy with the beard is the author. <laughs> the other guy is Adam Gopnik, who will be interviewing him and asking him questions. He is a renowned author with The New Yorker. Um, uh, and like Daniel Dinette, he has a great sense of humor. He likes to break down conventional ways of thinking, and also is good at doing many things. He's not a, you know, a, a unidirectional kind of character. Um, I, when I read his book, Paris to the Moon, I'll never forget the story about how long it took to find an OB hospital. It was opened in August in Paris, because I could just imagine myself, since I was of an age when that could have been me, looking for an OB hospital for a wife, that it was what that must have felt like. So we're pleased to have Daniel and Adam with us tonight. Uh, please join us in welcoming Daniel Dinette to the Free Library and Adam Gopnik. I don't know if there's more beautiful uh, juxtaposition of words in English, Dan, than Free Library. There. That's very good, yeah. <laughs> it's it's yeah, very good. Um, I should add, Dan and I represent two, though, friends, radically opposed um, poles in uh, in intellectual life. Dan represents uh, those who drink wine before they speak, and I represent the group that drinks wine after we speak. <laughs> so you'll have a chance to see this real abyss <laughs> in Listen cognition. Listen carefully. Listen <laughs> carefully. In that too. See if you can tell. Um, <laughs> Dan's new book, From Bacteria to Bach and Back Again, uh, is remarkable. In lots of ways, Dan, it's a kind of, I hesitate to use the word synthesis, but it's a kind of reduction, if you like, in the, in the cooking sense. It's a beautiful <laughs> reduction of ideas and yeah. uh, obsessions you've had for the past 50 years, really. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's, I keep telling the same story, but trying to make it better and fill in the gaps and respond to objections and add new bits. Yeah. And there were enough new bits, I think, so that I'm pretty happy with it. Well, one of the joys of the book and one of the things I, the first thing I would say about it, you know, the truth is I have sisters, a a uh, well-known psychologist, and she always said to me, remember, what people really love in a book or a talk is weird data, right? <laughs> you, you work so hard on the theoretical mm -hmm. stuff, and this book is packed with weird data, among <laughs> other things. You will learn an enormous amount about it, everything from why primates have a hard time synthesizing vitamin C and have to eat fruit, to uh, the, the actual nature of why it is when you move the document around on your screen, you are actually not moving a document around on your screen. And it's dense with weird data, and, but it's also dense with big ideas. I think I have told you at some time in the past, Dan, that uh, the only time in my life when my mind was changed by reading a book, you know how that is? Usually when we're engaged in, <laughs> in ideas at all, um, we read something that we don't agree with and we say, oh, that's all wrong. And then over time we say, well, maybe it's right, and then finally you say, oh, well, I knew that all along, right? Yeah, right. That's the, the What else is new? <laughs> exactly, yeah. nothing new about that. <laughs> but in fact, when I read your remarkable book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, it 
released me from my dogmatic slumbers, changed my whole view of Darwin, yeah. and pushed me eventually to write my own book on Darwin. Darwin is uh, Angels and Ages. Mm -hmm. Darwin is a stylist. My book was alliteratively A's. Your book is alliteratively B's. It's, um, it's your turn next. It, it, to you do know. the C book. Yeah, to, that's right. Yes. Um, Charles and Consciousness. Exact, exa well, that's not a bad title <laughs> for this book. Yeah. That's not a bad title for this. In yeah, fact, yeah. I was thinking you could leap to the M's in this book and call it Matter and Magic because that's sort of what it's about. Yeah. It's about how a completely materialist view of the world can still uh, supply for us uh, a non-condescending view of all the things we think of yeah. in our lives, yeah. 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 from love to liberty, that we, ah, there's the old <laughs> book. <laughs> it's, a but it's a catching it's habit, a ca Look It's out. a meme, it's, it's a, a meme. meme. But <laughs> Darwin is central to this book. You've got a Darwin Absolutely. pin on now. Am um, I right in thinking, Dan, that two things. First, that, um, your, s your understanding of the centrality of Darwin to philosophy and to human yeah. thinking came sort of in the middle of your career rather than at the very beginning of it. And secondly, mm. uh, more important, your view of Darwin is, if not unique, is specific. Darwin for you is no has nothing to do with um, the competition. I mean, it does, but it doesn't have anything to do with social Darwinism. It doesn't even have anything to do in a certain sense with uh, biology in some ways, it has to do with what you call Darwin's dangerous idea, which is really about the ability to create immensely intricate design without intentions. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, I had, uh, in my entrance into Darwinian, I had to sort of two steps. Mm -hmm. uh, first was my uh, discovery of what brains were made of neurons, and it just hit me like a thunderbolt when I was first told that, oh, Learning could be an evolutionary process in the brain. Learning is really puzzling. How does a system redesign itself mm -hmm. without knowing what it's doing? It has to use the information it's already got, and somehow it's got to improve itself. Well, if it already knows, then why does it bother? And if it doesn't, how can it do it? <laughs> and, which is an echo of right. Socrates, right. actually. And Darwin has the answer. It amplifies random mutations and simply the best ones survive, and you're off to the races. And the idea that learning is always, or as I tell my students, there's no learning without mistakes. And the whole point of learning is to, ch is to turn mistakes uh, into good stuff. The, there's a, there's a, a motto among software engineers, you know, it's not a bug, it's a feature. <laughs> And in fact, that could be the motto for Darwinism. Mm -hmm. Every mutation is a bug until it's a feature. Mm -hmm. And the brilliant thing about the Darwinian algorithm is that it just patiently waits for bugs which come all the time, not too many, but just enough, and it turns some of them into features without knowing why, and then they, that raises the bar and so it goes and so it goes. And then learning is just a continuation in the individual mind of what natural selection does anyway. Right. Now, it's important, I think, to emphasize, when, because it, your view of Darwin is gra as a gradualist, right? Change happens yep. slowly. But it's important to emphasize, because it's one of the things I think people get lost on sometimes, is that doesn't mean it can only happen uh, by tiny increments in ways that you have the notion that there can be big leaps in what you call design space yeah. that Darwinism allows us to yeah. understand. And um, one of my favorites is the so-called eukaryotic revolution. Uh, li the, the late, great Lynn Margulis was the, was the uh, chief uh, exponent of this, and it, she was scoffed at for years, and now it's in all the textbooks. Um, every human cell in your body is a so-called eukaryotic cell. And one thing that's interesting about it is it has two genomes. It has your nuclear DNA, that's your, your DNA proper, you might say, and then it has your mitochondrial DNA, which you only get from your mother. And that curious arrangement all goes back to a time more than two billion years ago when all there were were things like bacteria, very simple cells. And they've been evolving for a billion years all sorts of variety, and one day, it only had to happen once, two of them, oop, <laughs> <laughs> two of them collided, and instead of A eating B or B eating A, they stuck together. 
And it just happened that A, B together was more fit than A or B by themselves. And then they joined their fates and they, they reproduced together with both genomes. And that was the birth of the eukaryotic cell. And that made possible complex cells that could specialize. It could be bone cells and blood cells and hair cells and, and nerve cells and all the rest. It made multicellular life possible. No, no thing, no living thing large enough to see with the naked eye would exist if it weren't for that revolution. And it was, in effect, sudden. It was technology transfer. <laughs> right. Two independent traditions of R&D, research and development, <laughs> come together, and suddenly you've got a huge bonus. And I'm claiming in the book it happened twice. It happened more than twice. But the other big one, the one that really concerns me, is when our brains collided with memes to create minds. Yeah. And memes have their own e evolutionary history. They're sort of like viruses. They're made of information. And our brains have evolved to be very good at picking them up, copying them, and transmitting them. L let me stop you there, Dan, because this is the core of your book in yeah. lots of ways. Because yeah. the, the, what you're doing is trying to get us from bacteria to Bach on a, on a straight line, or at least in a long arc. And the concept of the meme is essential to, to, yep. to yep. your doing that work. Word, a term originally coined by Richard Dawkins yep. in his book, The Selfish Gene, one you've taken up. One that is, you know, many in the humanities deeply resist, and you outline their resistance and their yeah. arguments here. Briefly, if you can, explain what a meme is, yeah. how it's like a gene, you said, or yep. like a virus and how it differs from what we might just call an idea or yeah. a... Yeah. Um, a meme is one of those things, and they're very familiar to us, that isn't made out of ink or paper or wood or steel. It's a little bit odd to put it this way, but they're made out of information. A poem is a meme. Uh, a theory is a meme. A method like long division is a meme or alphabetizing a list of words, techniques. What a meme is, is a way of doing something. It's a way of behaving. It's a way of pronouncing the word controversy as opposed to controversy. <laughs> Those are ways. And we've got ways anyway. What are instincts? They're ways of doing things that are passed through the ger ger germline, through the genes. Mm -hmm. So the difference between an instinct and a meme is that instincts are passed through the genes from parents to offspring, and memes are transmitted sometimes from parents to offspring and sometimes from others to individuals, not through the egg and the sperm, but through perception, through interaction, social interaction, cultural interaction. Nice case to make it clear, think about birdsong. Do birds, does the typical song of the song sparrow, is that, a, is that an instinct or not? Well, the way you test that is you take the eggs from a sparrow's nest and you take the eggs from a wren's nest and you cross them. You put them so they have adoptive parents. And the question is, which song will they sing? If they sing their genetic parents' song, then it's an instinct passed through the genes. If they sing their adoptive parent song, then it isn't an instinct. It's a meme, really. And it turns out that birds are different. Some, some bird song is transmitted genetically, and some bird song is transmitted memetically, and both ways work. So, but if I, if I may, yeah. I, because the ex bird song example is nice, but it, I've always thought, and I think you use it very well here, that songs in general, melodies, are wonderful examples of what you mean by memes. Absolutely. You yeah. use green sleeves, for instance, in yeah, this book. Yeah. Right. And, one, and let me take that example. Uh, who's the composer of green sleeves? <laughs> <laughs> Almost <Right>. certainly not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the point is, the, the point is that songs today mostly have composers. But there were a lot of songs before there were composers. <coughs> and there were a lot of wonderful social inventions, artistic inventions, before there were artists, before there were intelligent designers. 
And it's not just that the author is lost to history, it's that so many different individuals have played a role in shaping what's happened that there's really no way of assigning credit. And not only that, they didn't even realize they were doing it. One of the important differences, to get to your point about what's the difference between an idea and right. a meme, is that memes, ideas are uh, pretty much by definition things you're aware of, they're conscious. Right. But a lot of memes spread without your even noticing. You suddenly realize, oh my goodness, the word incredible doesn't mean what it used mm -hmm. to mean. Or hopefully. Or, or hopefully, <laughs> right. or terrific, uh, or m many others we could think of. Um, that change in meaning has been imperceptibly gradual, and it's reached a point where the old meaning is now all but extinct. You see obsolete in the dictionary, and a new meaning has taken over. How did that happen? Did somebody legislate it? No. Did somebody design it? No. Differential replication. One version spread and spread and spread and beat out, had more offspring than the others. And it's this winning the replication tournament, just as in natural selection of organisms, that explains the changes in culture, at least in the early days. Right, and, and also explains, I, I think, the, uh, <coughs> the continuities of culture. We still yeah. sing Green Sleeves. Green no. Sleeves is, a, is now, what child is this? It's a it's played by the modern jazz quartet, and it, it propagates in that way in yep. many different yep. environments and in many different uh, ecologies. You also make the point that memes can be, and this is very important for our Darwinian picture of them, they can be uh, noxious. They, they don't yep. have to be yep. advantageous in any way. Greensleeves yep. is an advantageous melody, but you have a nice example of, of, a, of one we hear every day, of a, of a crabgrass in the field of memes. Kids uh, uh, saying like. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um. I was making the point to my students once about how uh, a word uh, or an expression, a meme, a verbal meme, for instance, can spread and spread hard and not be of any use to anybody. It's not increasing your popularity or health or anything. And it just spreads because it can, just like a virus. And one of my students one day said, um, can you give me an example of that? And I said something like, well, it's like when, you know, you like start talking <laughs> and like the, it occurs to you that maybe like there might be some example of like, and I went on like that for a minute or so. And then the kid looked at me and he said, I get the point. I want an example. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that, sir. I want to come back to that, to the like thing, because I actually wrote an essay about the way teen speak uses like, which touches in a complicated way on now, and now I'll be the, the obnoxious uh, uh, humanist on the, uh, sitting up here tonight, on what humanists, so-called, people in humanities, why they tend to be reluctant. I think we've sketched out the advantages yeah. of the mimetic view of memes. Why humanists, as a rule, and I think you'd agree with me, tend to be oh. either stubbornly retrograde or uh, uh, sophisticated in their view. Here are the two things, it seems to me, that, that uh, humanists, broadly speaking, people in humanities object to. First, they argue about the role of artifice in making up memes. In other words, oh. they say, there, sure, there are examples like the way words change meaning or the way vowels change or so on, or the way a melody might mm. get adapted. But when we're talking about really significant human innovations, we're talking about things like Bach's Cantatas, which you write about Shakespeare's here. Shakespeare's sonnets. Shakespeare's sonnets, Karl Marx, Das Kapital, um, uh, John Stuart Mill's On Liberty. And these things have an intentional artifactual quality, which are nothing like the way that genes mutate. They change in a random way. Um, human minds, human consciousness changed when the Declaration of Independence appeared, and that wasn't a random mutation. That was an artifactual yeah. act. Isn't that, doesn't that, in the first place, distinguish memes from, from what you, from, from Darwinian evolution from cultural evolution? Well, I've got a very Darwinian answer, yes and no. <laughs> it's gradual. One of the innovations in the book is my plotting of the evolution of cultural evolution. The very process of cultural evolution 
started out very Darwinian, very mimetic, where the vectors, the people, were basically clueless. They didn't understand. They were, they were the memes that they were uh, uh, spreading were, were like viruses. They were like the cold. The, uh, they didn't know what they were doing or why. Some of them helped them, some of them didn't. But, the, but some of them were really infectious. Gradually over time, these very memes became thinking tools which could help them reflect on their circumstances and make them more savvy about how they went about their lives. And over time, this changed the selection pressures and made the whole process of cultural evolution less and less Darwinian. You got more and more comprehension, more and more intention, more and more look ahead, more and more uh, directed search rather than random search. Right. And, and so that's where we've moved from this basically pretty clueless world of early hominid meme use, which is, by the way, not unlike the, the world of, of songbirds. Mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> they're not composers. You know, they're, they're singers. They're singers, and th they don't even really know why they're singing. Right. Uh, so, but there's a reason. Mm -hmm. But now, what we've ended up in in the last, you know, two thousand years, which is just a twinkling, we've ended up with what I call the age of intelligent design. Mm -hmm. We really do have intelligent designers. We really do have foresight. We have people that plan and make artifacts where they figure out in advance why they're making them and how they work and so forth. That's, I'm not denying that, but I'm saying that's the limiting case at the top of this space of possible cases. And when you study culture, you have to look at all the junk in addition to all the treasures. Yeah. And you have to realize that internet memes are just as good memes as memes, they're fit. They're mm -hmm. embarrassingly fit. They're shockingly fit. Mm -hmm. They spread virally, as one says, uh, just as much as new theories in biology or, or physics. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to get them all in the same stage at once because culture is both good, bad, and indifferent. Mm -hmm. So if I understand you, Dan, that your claim is, is that when we look at a Bach cantata, let's say, it's very much like pre-Darwinian people looking at an elephant and saying, well, how could, or people who've just been exposed to Darwin, looking at an elephant and saying, oh, come on, you can't possibly get there from these tiny little changes in earthworms to something that magnificent. You're saying the Bach cantata sits at the end of a long history yeah. of cultural evolution, very much as the elephant, yeah. or we and, sit and at the end of a long history of uh, and genetic evolution. And, and it's not that the gradual process doesn't have some amazing uh, sharp turns and twists. Mm -hmm. That's one of the points of the book, is to describe some of the really crucial changes which, which turned our minds, and really only our minds, into intelligent designing minds. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't happen overnight. And one of the things that I think people need to realize is that we tend in retrospect, to crown our own achievements with more foresight and more reasoning than in fact they deserve. <laughs> it's a very cut. <laughs> Have you ever played a chess game where you made a move that turned out to be brilliant, but you didn't realize it until you won? <laughs> and then not admit it? <laughs> that you, I don't know why I did that. <laughs> it was just a random move. And then somebody says, oh, deep insight there. You say, oh, yeah, deep <laughs> insight. Um, we all do that all the time, and a remarkable proportion of what we take in the normal days, normal living, to be intelligently, intentionally designed excellences are excellences which maybe today, in retrospect, we can understand why they're so wonderful, but that doesn't mean that their creators understood a half of it. Mm -hmm. I have this lovely example of fishing boats in, in Breton. And uh, a fl French philosopher way back in 1908, Alain, who wrote about them, and he said, uh, uh, think about these fishing boats from a Darwinian perspective. Um, 
the boats that, that, that come back get copied. The boats that sink don't. <laughs> um, if it comes back, copy it. That's the rule. Right. That's natural selection. Right. And, and it does two things. It stabilizes a good tradition of boat building in the sea proves that this is a good design. And notice, very important, if a little bit unnerving, does it require any comprehension of uh, hydrodynamics and, and marine architecture and so forth? Not really. In fact, many a boat designer builder has had a brilliant idea and made a boat by this new plan, and the boat sinks. Uh, the proof of the pudding is whether it comes back. And and very often, too much thinking can actually prevent you from seeing a better solution. Mm -hmm. Nature has proved that again and again and again. So m it's not just the wing of the bird and the roots of the tree that are designed by natural selection. Religious traditions, languages, governmental traditions, other institutions of society, genre of art, across the cultural board, there are really salient examples of things which had no author. They are wonderful, but there's no author for them. And so it's just a mistake to think of them as a product of intelligent design. Right. Um, I, I, you know, I just realized there's a, a mimetic change, right, which is that's overcome most of us. I no longer wear a wristwatch because I depend on my phone to tell me the time. So when I'm trying to keep track of where we are in our conversation, I have to take my phone out of my pocket to do it, right? You're just enough older to still wear a wristwatch, <laughs> right, on your hand. There's a piece of cultural evolution. Yeah, yeah, right there. Right there. Um, the, the, uh, all right, let me still play the role of the stubborn yep. and ignorant humanist, right, <laughs> and say here's mm. the other objection people typically make towards thinking that they'll say, OK, I'll buy the boats, right? Artifacts are well described. Functional artifacts, well described by that, by mm -hmm. some evolutionary system. Word change, well described by that. But, and now you've given us an answer for why big artifacts, Shakespeare plays and Bach cantatas, can also be well described by that system if we understand them as the end result of a long process, not as things that no. emerge from, from nowhere. Right, here's the other thing I think humanists usually would say about why they are skeptical of it. They'd say, we have a capacity for lack of a better word, for, sort of, for moral argument. In other words, our choices aren't just made by what works or what doesn't work. We try to say, that may work, but it's a terrible thing to do, whether it's female yeah. geni uh, uh, genital mutilation or uh, throwing Jews down the well because they uh, poison children. Whatever it is, we actually, most of, a lot of our cultural life, mm -hmm involves not accepting the working of replication, mm. but intervening in mm -hmm. that working of replication through what we call moral argument. Yeah. How, how does that work in, the, in that scheme? Why doesn't that yeah. change it so dramatically that it's, not a, that it's not a good, no longer a good analogy? Moral argument does play a very important role in human culture. It's not God-given. It evolved. And nobody today would be comfortable living with, say, Old Testament morality. How has it evolved? It has evolved. Well, there may be some in the current administration, but other than that. <laughs> I really wonder. I mean, I think they put those, they put the Ten Commandments up, and I, wait a minute. Have you read, have you read the list, actually? Yeah. Have you thought about it? Do you really think these are the best rules? Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, uh, the way that morality has itself evolved, I would say clearly for the better, is by a rational process, a communal, political process of gradual persuasion and concession and uh, seldom by force, although sometimes force does come in and play yeah. a fairly important role in uh, implementing or enforcing new rules. The American Civil War would be a nice example of this. Uh, yes, or desegregation right. of the schools. Um, those processes are social processes. Many of the features of those social processes were worked out very carefully and intelligently by people like the framers of the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, and so forth, and judges writing opinions and all the rest. And that really is intelligent design. 
but it also has to stand the test of time. Laws need every social phenomenon that has a significant non-ephemeral effect has to survive, it has to persist. And in the end, it has to persist because it grabs people in a way that gets them to copy it, mm -hmm. to keep it going. It's the, the books in the library will turn to dust. But if you really want those ideas to save them, then you'll do a new edition and you'll sell more copies and you'll protect them. It's, it's, not, the, it's not the quality of the paper and the ink. It's the choices made by human beings. And those are not just random choices, they're informed choices. So the whole mimetic structure feeds on itself. What we have in our head is thousands and thousands of thinking tools, which some of us use very well and some of us use not so well. But we know how to use them and how to use them to change people's minds on occasion and to open their minds to new possibilities. And morality and moral thinking, uh, contrary, in fact, it's, it's sort of interesting to see that, that uh, the idea that if God is dead, then everything is permitted. Why would God's pronouncement be a better reason for thinking something was right or wrong than the fact that so the community right. consensus is, right. we've thought about it pretty hard, and this is the way we want people to live. Right. I mean, Hitting kids is bad yeah. seems just as strong as God saying yeah, it, yeah. are saying it, right. I mean, I, I yeah. once, when I was doing my, my religion book, uh, going around doing <laughs> book tours, I was on some, uh, you know, right-wing talk radio, religious radio shows. And, and uh, 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 at one point, uh, uh, several times, I, somebody would say something, and I'd say, no, Lucille says you're wrong. <laughs> what? <laughs> hey, Lucille says you're wrong. <laughs> Who's Lucille? Oh, a friend of mine. She's always right. <laughs> well, that's clearly rude. Right. <laughs> it's, and it has no role in a rational discussion. Right. God says it's wrong is exactly the same rude thing to say. And what did the right-wing radio host say it after you introduced well, Lucille? Sort of splutter, splutter, <laughs> splutter. <laughs> we'll take our next call from yeah. the, <laughs> exactly. I'm very, I'm very impressed, Dan, that you went, you took the fight to, to right-wing radio. Well, no, I, I was, I was not as as much of a road warrior as Hitch was. Right. Hitch, Hitch went out and went all over the Bible Belt. I didn't. I but but I. But I did some of that by radio. Right. right. Well, he thrived. He's one of those rare people who yeah. thrives on conflict. And Absolutely. And, yeah. and did it too. Um, that's a special mutation, actually, in, in, in culture. Yes. Let, coming back to the book. All right. So, there, so we deal with the central part of the book has to do with this notion of how cultural, culture evolves and so on. But you're really not, you don't want to end there. You're not just content to show us that Bach depends on what happened with the bacteria. You want then to talk to us about, not just about the things we make, but our ability to perceive, to understand the things we make. Why is it that when we mm. listen to Bach, we don't just hear it, we know it in some way. We're conscious of it. We have this great gift yeah. of consciousness. And this has been a preoccupation of yours, I think it's <coughs> fair to say, for half a century. Yeah, in yeah writing absolutely. About. And uh, doubtless, you know, we all are associated with one word. If you forgive me a, a story. I was once doing hosting an evening where I had to give prizes to Tony Kushner, the great playwright, and Meryl Streep, the great actress. And we were in the green room beforehand, and Tony Kushner said, you know, we're all going to be reduced to one word. He said, my word is AIDS. And Meryl Streep said, my word is accents. <laughs> 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 and your word, the word you'll be reduced to, is consciousness. Probably. And particularly, yeah. consciousness doesn't exist, right? In Alas. And that's what people <laughs> will say. But having said, people then respond, I'm shocked. Count, not countless, but you have tried to explain what you mean when you say consciousness yeah. does not exist and yeah. yet we have it many times. This yeah. seems to me the most succinct explanation well, you've come up well, with yet. But would you share it with our audience, yeah. what it is you mean and why it, and what it is you're not saying and what you are saying? Uh, let me start by more or less quoting from a, uh, one of my favorite passages from a book on magic 
uh, Nets of Magic by uh, Lee Siegel, a philosopher and a magician, a very fine magician. And he has a little coda where he says, I tell my friends I'm writing a book on magic, and they say, real magic? <laughs> by which they mean thaumaturgical <laughs> acts and sorcery. And he says, no, you know, sleight of hand, stage magic. And then he goes on to say, in other words, the kind of magic that can actually be done is not real magic. <laughs> <laughs> that sums up your view. The well, kind of consciousness you can actually have is like yeah, stage magic. A, a lot of people have an idea of consciousness where if it isn't magic, then it's not consciousness. Real consciousness has to be real magic. It has to be supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Mm -hmm. It has to defy science. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, no, no, it doesn't. I've got an account of consciousness that explains all the data, or could explain all the data. We haven't got it all done yet. And it shows how it seems to be magic and why that's a sort of friendly user illusion. Mm -hmm. It's actually, it's a, it's not a bug, it's a feature. In the same way that your desktop user illusion on your computer, brilliantly designed to be make it easier for you to do, you don't have to know what's going on inside your computer. You've got this metaphorical but vivid image of what's going on in your computer. 16 documents out on my desktop. Desk and little, and little folders that you can put on in each and other, you can right. drag and drop and all of that stuff, little sound effects that go with it. That bears a very, very indirect relationship to what's actually going on, on in the, in the hardware. And similarly, your view of your own mind is like that. It's the brain's user illusion of itself. The desktop version right. of what's going on in there. And, and it's been brilliantly designed by evolution to make life easier for you. you. You couldn't keep track of all those details in your brain. You wouldn't want to. And you wouldn't want to keep track of all the details out in the world. What you want to keep track of are the things that matter. And you want to do it in jig time. Speed is of the essence. And uh, good enough for government work is what, is what <laughs> you want. Good enough for the mind. You, you know, you <laughs> and so what happens is that every organism is equipped. Every, say, locomoting organism. Oh, I'll even let in trees. They have a, they have a manifest image of yeah. sorts, too, because there's things that matter to trees that they are capable of sensing and discriminating. Pretty much they're clueless, mm -hmm. but they do have a few things that they're very sensitive to. We're sensitive to gazillions of things, but not everything. And our way of being sensitive to things depends on what kind of things we are and what we need and what we want. And we can adjust our focus, if you like, or change our user illusions uh, and become conscious of things we weren't otherwise conscious of. But the idea, I guess what I'm saying is the idea, I want to rehabilitate the word illusion. As a good thing. As a good thing. Right. In, in, and thank you to the, to the computer designers. They've done that. They, they speak unapologetically about the user illusion. That's a good thing. And it's real, but it isn't a real account. It isn't an accurate account of what's, what's really doing going the work. On, right. And the same thing is true of what's going on in your brain. But it does mean when you take this in, you have to realize that some things that seem, seem just obvious, they just aren't true. Thank you, Professor Jeanette. Uh, speaking of illusion, I wanted to uh, ask you whether you still believe that your brain, um, I, I wanted to ask you whether your brain automatically and involuntarily still causes you to believe that we have free will. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is a small subject, free yeah. will. <laughs> Glad you raised it. We needed a Well, we you know, I have written two books and several dozen articles <laughs> on the topic, so you don't exactly catch me unprepared. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm going to play the card I just played before. It depends what you mean by free will. If you mean something that's actually important to us, like it grounds our responsibility, it's what justifies us in holding ourselves and others responsible, and so forth, then I certainly do believe in free will. Just the other day, I signed a legal document, and the notary turned to me and said, are you signing this of your own free will? And I said, yes. <laughs> and I wasn't lying. 
and she was not asking me about determinism. <laughs> Good thing. There's other people, uh, aided and abetted and, and encouraged by a certain kind of philosophers, who thinks this is, this is like real magic, that if it isn't real magic, it isn't real free will. They, uh, I sometimes call this moral levitation. Mm -hmm. they, they think that if their decisions are not somehow completely isolated from the causal milieu and from their past, they're not their decisions. They want, they want their decisions to float somehow independent of, of everything around. Crazy idea. <laughs> now, why do people think they want that? that? The challenge that I now put to libertarians and people like that is I say, yeah, you can, you can define a kind of free will that we don't have. And I want to know, who cares? Wh why, why would you want that kind of free will? What would it get you? That, that you don't have, would you, why would you prefer that your children have it than not, for <laughs> instance? Why would you care whether the babysitter that, take, that you entrust your children to, why would you care whether that person had that kind of freedom? That is a will of the wisp, that is a fantasy. Yes, I have so many parts of my question, I don't know if I can get them all out. Well, let's just try two parts, <laughs> all right? So I was thinking about your example of bird song and the bird swap ex and the egg swap, and I was thinking about languages. I'm assuming you wouldn't call languages a meme. Is that correct? Oh, languages That's are made of memes. Words are memes that can be pronounced. But you would say whole languages and language learning is a meme? I would say that when the process of learning a language is installing half a dozen memes a day, pronounceable memes a day in your in your brain from birth to age five, uh, and that's about right. Yeah, you, every time, when, when you learn words, you're acquiring a new meme. Each word is a meme. Okay, I was thinking about all about language learning and the swap of the eggs. Any child that's brought up in any possible language community will learn the language that's of that right. community. That's right, that's right. It's not, it's not genetic. Uh, but I would say, that the language learning is an instinct, just as bird song is an instinct that's hardwired into our brains. Right. That's a good. That's a very good point. Now, that's a good and that, point, right? No, that's a good point. Um, right. Because and we fact, all, in fact, our friend Steve Pinker wrote a, a well-received book instinct. called "Language Instinct," and that's, of course, the view of Noam Chomsky and yep. my mother yep. and other people yep. who we should pay attention to. Um, yeah. So, how do you rectify yeah. saying it's mimetic evolution, but it's still instinctual? Yep. Um, Peter Marler, what the great bird ecologist right. sp speaks about an instinct to learn. And that's what birds have. They have an instinct to learn the song. You know, you notice that uh, other creatures who can vocalize, they don't have an instinct to learn those songs. It's, so there is definitely an instinctual part. There is a genetic component. Um, uh, Chomsky made it famous or infamous by talking about what he called the language acquisition device, which was supposedly the genetic uh, machinery that you're born with, right. which you then tweak out and, and mm -hmm. install the language, which whether it's Chinese or English, or whatever, depending on where you grow up. Now, this idea of a language acquisition device is in some ways a brilliant oversimplification. Uh, but in any case, it raises the question of, and how did that get in there? How did it evolve? Mm -hmm. Chomsky is notoriously silent on that question because he just he really doesn't like to He's think about it. He's more than silent. Evolution. He forbids he speculation. Forbids, he, he tries to forbid, forbid speculation discussion about, about the evolution of the language instinct. Right. Steve Pinker, on the other hand, is, is on, only too happy <laughs> right. to talk about it, and so are a bunch of other people. The Chomskyan uh, pro, uh, prohibition of theorizing about the evolution of language is, is now lapsed, mm -hmm. and there's a plethora of interesting work, uh, empirically guided work, very imaginative work by a whole number numbers of researchers, and there's a whole chapter, actually really sort of two chapters in the book on that devoted to how language got started. And one of the and really important things to recognize, and I'm saying recognize, I don't think this is even should even be controversial now. The only way you can explain the instinctual part of language is by recognizing that memes came first because they can evolve so much faster than brains can. 
and memes established themselves, and this created a selection pressure on brains that was a genetic pressure. So we got better and better and better, our ancestors got better and better and better word processing brains because they now had to deal in a, wor in a world where there were lots of memes. words. Right. So it's, again, it's software precedes hardware. Mm -hmm. The design of the memes comes first and then the brain plays genetic catch up and redesigns the hardware to deal better and better with those words. Yeah, no. Thank you. I'm a very, very novice amateur astronomer, and a delightful thing to do with the telescope is to point it at the Orion Nebula. And with a twist of the dial and the focus, you can view a beautiful nebula, or you can look at some very interesting stars in there. And when it comes to the topic of consciousness, I absolutely agree that you can focus on consciousness as its constituent parts. But you just gave us a wonderful language that could say maybe we're not focusing on the whole in that if consciousness is like a eukaryotic cell, some symbiotic entity marrying our biology and whatever memes reside in, maybe it's a different sort of thing entirely. Well, thank you. I, that's not a question, but I think <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a good... It's, well, let, it's me, a, let me you know, try and turn it in the form of a question, something that you raise here, is that uh, mm -hmm. could we imagine intelligent life without consciousness? In other words, could we have intelligent zom um, zombies, essentially, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. that are smart, but... Mm -hmm. Uh, not conscious no. in that, in your way. Because well, it seems to me, I, I once thought it was one of my proudest aphorisms that Dennett doesn't believe in the ghost in the machine. He believes consciousness is the hum of the machinery. If yeah, you've got well, that much smart, you got to have, you gotta, you're going to be conscious. Yeah, but I put it a little differently. I like, I like, the, I like the aphorism, but I want to tweak it a little Please. bit. Please. Um, That's mimetic evolution yeah, in the action. Right here. <laughs> Intelligent design. Please. <laughs> uh, one of the themes in the book, which I really stress, is what I call competence without comprehension. And that's what comes first. Evolution itself, natural selection, is a very competent process, designed for us, doesn't understand a thing. It is completely mindless. Bacteria, very competent, they don't understand what they're doing. Stotting gazelles and the lions and dogs that chase them, very competent, but they don't under have to understand what they're doing. The whole idea of comprehension, I claim, is a sort of human invention. There's sort of behavioral comprehension. Yeah. The comprehension a beaver has of how to make a dam and the comprehension a bear has of how to find food. Yeah. But even for a wily bear, a great deal of the cleverness in its behavior is something which it doesn't know why it does that, it just does it, and it's the right thing to do. The reasons are not the bear's reasons. Mm -hmm. The reasons are free-floating rationales in nature. Mm -hmm. So, let's see, where, where was this? Oh Which yes, was, the zombie. Right, right. The philosophical idea of a zombie is, I think, breathtakingly um, forlorn. <laughs> As are most zombies when we, we, when we encounter well, them. Well, no, no, the thing is, that's not true because um, when people think of zombies, most people who aren't philosophers, they think of the walking yeah, dead. Yeah, right. But a philosopher zombie isn't that at all. You might be a philosophy, philosophical zombie, so might right. I. Your best friends may be zombies. In fact, you might be a zombie. Because the whole idea of a philosopher zombie is that you're, a, you're behaviorally indistinguishable from an actual from conscious. an actual conscious person. It's just that there's nobody home. Mm -hmm. uh, there just seems to be somebody. Once home. again, the current administration <laughs> comes to mind. And it's <laughs> uh -huh. I, you gave no. Them a I think name. that's much but more like The Walking Dead. <laughs> <laughs> the major theme here is is that both intelligent design and a certain kind of evolution means they both exist. It's not one or the other. That's part of the process. I understand your emphasis on the evolutionary part and the mimetic part, but it seems to me, or at least I have the image, that when the two get together, that's a powerful thing. 
in the same way that the two bacteria get together, create something neither could do alone. And uh, could you say a little bit about that? Are there words to describe that? I, I assume. Oh yes, there are. <laughs> e e even what happened after the enough boats came back so that yeah. they began to m mimic them, <coughs> there was intelligent design that took it somewhere. Well, yes. Thank you for asking that question because we didn't get around to the third B in right. my title and back, from bacteria to Bach and back. That's the last chapter, and it's the scary yeah. chapter. Francis Crick once, as a sort of joke, enunciated the principle which he called Orgel's second rule, after Leslie Orgel, his colleague, evolution is cleverer than you are. Now, what he meant was not that evolution has a mind, that he wasn't an intelli ID intelligent design person. He just meant that the, the products of evolution are unbelievably cleverly, in intricately, cunningly, efficiently designed, and we, Scientists routinely underestimate how deliciously excellent the designs are until they start trying to improve on them or understand why they work the way they do. So remember that Orgel's second rule, evolution is cleverer than you are. A lot of people in the last few years, in the last decade, have been putting that to use in a very interesting way. They have been inventing evolutionary ways of doing science and, te and technology taking advantage of this tremendous, mindless, comprehensionless power that evolution has. And it's called deep learning and Bayesian networks and uh, connectionist networks, neural nets, the whole new way. Give an example. Wouldn't Google Translate Watson. be a Google example? Google Translate's a perfect example. Right. Um, it doesn't understand a thing. The way it works is by just going piggyback on all the good translation that's already out there. And it uses very fancy statistical techniques and it doesn't, it doesn't know what it's talking about. It has it no idea of no grammar idea. or the meaning of the language. No, no. Right. But it does a very passable job of translation. Yeah. It's not perfect. Doug Hofstadter, by the way, has a lovely new essay showing how easy where it, it is. Where it fails, right. Yeah, where, how to trip it up. Right. Uh, 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 if anybody would be able to do it, he is, and he's done a very good job of that. I think it's online somewhere, but I'm not sure. Um, but So Google Translate would be a good example of this. But Google Translate is a very handy thing, just like GPS. But this is now beginning also to enter into science itself. And we're beginning to get what some people call black box science, where you have this wonderful technology, which you yourself don't understand, because you're not the programmer who made the machine, you buy the machine, you put your data in, you push the button and out comes an answer and you can trust that answer up to a significant Reason. point. You can more or less prove that it's going to be right almost all the time and to do a much better job than you, but you don't understand how it got there. And the very idea that we might give up trying to understand and just push buttons and do black box science is a very unsettling uh, prospect. And there's more that's even more unsettling because, as you know, use it or lose it, we're all losing the capacity to read maps well and plan routes because we have GPS. What's next? All kinds of things are next. The doctor of the future is in danger of being basically like a hotel doorman, you know, <laughs> nice smile, push a few buttons, good bedside manner, and let the technology do all the diagnosis and all the, all the treatment. You, you make the point that in the famous passage in Robinson Crusoe, where Robinson yeah. Crusoe makes the list of the things he's going to do on the island, none of us could do those things. We yeah, have no we've, idea. We're, we've become extremely dependent on this epistemological technology, and it's much more fragile than you might think. I am very concerned about a prospect which I've been gun talking about in, in audiences when I get the chance. I'll try to be brief about this, but I want it to sink in. Suppose the internet goes down. A lot of experts say, just a matter of time, it will. It's not a question mm -hmm. of right. if, it's when. Suppose the internet goes down. What will it take down with it? It'll take down the cell phones. They shouldn't 
It shouldn't, but it will because they've become dependent on the internet. It'll probably take down the power grid. It'll take down the television stations, the radio stations. We will be plunged into electronic darkness in an instant. The just-in-time trucks won't know when to deliver the groceries. The won't be able to pump the gas out of the gas station. The, the water plant won't know how to, won't be able to pump water. We will be thrust back into the 19th century in a few seconds. Think of the panic. I submit that even if we fixed it in 48 hours, the damage that would be done by people going just out of their minds panicking would be catastrophic. Would, would be the worst thing that ever happened in this nation. And it's entirely possible. It could happen tomorrow. Now, what should we do about it? I've been thinking about this and talking about this for a couple of years now with various people and building up some ideas. First of all, the solution has to be local, bottom-up, and non-technological. What it has to be is People who can get in touch with each other without any electronic means, neighbors, friends, neighborhoods, parts of cities, towns, where people will have volunteered to become part of the, the knowledge node for that group and know who knows how to repair a diesel engine, where can you get uh, fresh water, who needs to get pills brought to her house uh, every day, and so forth and so on. And the, one of the most important things is that this little volunteer community, sort of like a volunteer fire department in some ways, or sort of like a, a church group, would be known in the community as the place to go. So what I would really like to see happen is for people to, to talk about this and get used to this idea and start talking to their neighbors and friends, and if you have any special skills, letting people know about it. Share, use the internet while you got it. Share information, figure out best practices. I'm sure I haven't thought of a fraction of 1% of all the good ideas about how to do this. Main thing, it has to be bottom up. It can't be top down. Don't get the government involved. People wouldn't trust it, and nor should they. But when I, when I learned to scuba dive, my instructor impressed on me very, very much that the greatest enemy was panic. And if you start feeling panic, stop everything and try to dampen down that panic because panic makes you crazy. You do stupid, destructive things. You'll kill yourself or your buddy or both. And so we, I think of this as panic absorbers. And the way they work is when that horrible thing happens, it would be wonderful if, not everybody, most people, their first thought is, who knows what, really frantic. Their second thought is, now wait a minute, I know where to go. <laughs> it's a little bit, I can't remember what movie it is where, where uh, uh, Dreyfus goes running around the house yelling, call 911, call 911. He's got, he's got that little app in his head that says, call 911, because something bad has happened. Well, that, well, that's not going to work. You won't be able to call 911. So we have to replace that with a habit, which we get into our heads. So if that ever happens, we got an answer. We, we, we know something to do. And so... That's an app I want to install in everybody's neck top. <laughs> <laughs> it would make a wonderful little book, Dan, um, Where Will You Go When the Internet Goes Down, and talking about that. Yeah. It's the idea, too, of communities of competence, mm. of the importance mm -hmm. of communities of competence, which I've been saying for the past six months has never been more important it's to the continuum. Exactly. I think, and creating islands of trust. Islands of trust. And if I may say, because I'm afraid we have to stop, as the psychoanalyst says, um, that <laughs> one of the things that we recognize in those communities of competence, we know we will need a philosopher because you have shown us why we would need him tonight. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.